now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Grace Carney. Michael. 
reaching out through facebook and doing my best to keep everyone updated on the latest news was a blessing to me and michael we deeply appreciated all the positive thoughts and prayers that you all sent in our direction it gave us inspiration and motivation to keep going don't stop do our best each and every day Michael was also a lifelong learner. He had a strong desire to learn about different cultures and of course the music of each culture. This could only be carried out by visiting the actual countries and truly experiencing the beauty of these cultures. Something he also felt was necessary for his students to experience, which is why he took several groups of students and teachers to Brazil and also Ghana, West Africa. Another significant part of his life was being parked on the couch, <laughs> thoroughly enjoying hours upon hours of following his favorite sports, football, baseball, and basketball, in no particular order. This was his favorite way of relaxing after a long day at work. And this is not to say that he did not enjoy his long days at work. I truly don't know anyone who loved his work more. When it comes to the importance of life, I think the most meaningful message that resonated in Michael was that we all deserve to be happy. Such a simple concept, but one that seems to bring clarity time and time again. It's a message that Michael shared with me in the beginning of our time together, and a, mes a message that will continue to give me clarity throughout my life. We all deserve to be happy. Michael was also a firm believer in everything happening for a reason. This is also something that we agreed was true in the beginning and something we had the opportunity to talk about a few times in the last month of his life. We may not know what these reasons are in the middle of it all, but we know that eventually the answers will unfold in their own time. On this note, Michael and I believe that we have all crossed paths for one reason or another, and in many cases, we have yet to know its significance. I truly look forward to meeting many of you whom I haven't met yet, but who knew Michael and, shared, and also sharing stories of our dearly departed. I know that many of Michael's students thought of him as a father figure, as well as a mentor and teacher, a very special person in countless ways. I'm thrilled to share that Dr. Dave Gerhardt, a former, a former student of Michael's, will be continuing to lead and inspire a new generation of musicians at the Bob Cole Conservatory of Music. It's the way Michael wanted it, and I know that he'll do a wonderful job. Michael was a remarkable man, my soulmate, my sweetie, my everything. I loved him dearly with every ounce of my heart, and I always will. His departure from our physical world was a miracle itself. Although he lived a short life, he also lived a very full life and we can be sure that his spirit will live on forever. Until we meet again, Michael, I love you. to offer words for remembrance here today. 
Let me first say that I offer my deepest and most sincere condolences to Michael's family. In fact, the two greatest pillars of Michael's life were his family and his music. It is so appropriate that we have all come together today to honor his memory by bringing those two pillars of his life together. Thank you to everyone for your musical performances today, and I am sure that Michael would have been very proud. Michael never gave up. He never gave up on a performance. He never gave up on a piece of music. He never gave up on a student. And he never gave up on his family. He never gave up on life. From the moment of his diagnosis, he continued to fight courageously throughout the conflict and confusion of his treatment. And he shared his spirit with his family and his, and his friends through his very last day. It is impossible to express how deeply he will be missed. Michael was my friend for 25 years and there are some things I'll never forget about him. I'll never forget how we met. It was the spring of 1987 in Fresno, California at a Percussive Art Society Day of Percussion. We were both backstage before a performance and within about two minutes of talking to him, he made some outrageous wise crack and he had me laughing my head off. And I knew right then and there that I had a friend for life and we managed to find ways to uh, work together, play music together for the next 25 years. I'll never forget what a great musician that he was. He had a very refined musical taste and sensibility. And in short, he had an uncanny sense of knowing what was good. He was a great improviser, and he had an incredible ear for music. Basically, I always thought he was a natural. And I always learned something by listening to one of his solos, and even more by talking to him about it. I'll remember those experiences forever. I'll also never forget the doors that Michael opened for me. The first time that I went to Trinidad in the Caribbean, it was with Michael. The first time that I went to Brazil, that was with Michael. The first time that I went to Africa, it was not with Michael, but it was because of Michael. <laughs> and how many of us here today can say the same or similar things? I know that Michael opened many doors for his students through the years, not only in terms of travel to faraway places, but also by exposing them to the music of the world. And finally, in the real life terms of helping them to make their careers by performing these musics. I know that there are so many pan players in Los Angeles today and also people who regularly perform Brazilian music, African musics, and I can only guess and wonder how many of them had their first exposure to that music through Michael. Michael was an explorer, and he was fearless in his exploration. I think that somehow we all benefited from that. Finally, I'll never forget Michael's ability to talk to people, especially about experiences that he had or places that he had traveled to. Michael was a great storyteller and a great speaker, and he had many great experiences to share. And often it was through these stories that he would inspire people to do things even beyond their own expectation of themselves. He was a true leader in that way, and I personally have him to thank for inspiring me on many occasions. In fact, I mean, those of you who know me, you know I love words. And uh, the words inspire and expire, well, they're very close. They both come from the same Latin root for spirit, spiare, breath. Expire, well, of course, it means to breathe out, that the breath has gone. Inspire, on the other hand, means that the breath has come inside you, that you are inspired. And that's how I'm leaving here today, with Michael's spirit and Michael's memory in me.
May he rest in peace. Thank you. But 
I think he knew before I knew that the YouTube star wasn't going to happen because he said, don't put my name on these videos. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had to say, Noel, Carney, and Dad. <laughs> but um, he wasn't embarrassed for me, he just his reputation was too high. Um, excuse me while I take a drink. If you can't tell, my brother's funnier than I am, but we got it all from my dad because he's so weird. <laughs> Whew, anyways. So, uh, I've been going to Cal State Fullerton this past year and I'm majoring in musical theater. And I haven't been performing this year because my schedule is crazy, but it's been hard because dad was really sick, so he wasn't able to come to a lot of my performances if I would have been in, but my senior year, I got to be in my senior musical, and um, I remember dad was really sick during that, but he came, and I was also very, very lucky to share this moment with him. Um, my senior year, I was nominated for Homecoming Queen, and um, like, I went through a period of time where I was pretty upset with dad for not staying with our family, and when you're on homecoming court, your opposite sex parent walks you down the field. And I didn't know if I wanted dad to walk me down the field because kids hold grudges, you know? And um, I sat down with my mom and I told her that maybe I wanted her to walk me. And one day my dad came up to me and he said like, I really wanna walk you down the field. Like it would be such an honor as a dad. I'm so proud of you and everything you've done, and you're such a great person, and I wanna be that person that gets to do that with you. And I decided to be nice. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I really wanted him to walk me down. And um, we sat down and we got really close during that week, and he walked me down the field, and he got in his tux, and he matched my dress, and we walked down together and it was so special for me because I, I don't know, I miss, I miss having my dad, you know? And so we got to walk down the field and we stood there and everyone else got introduced. We were the first couple and then they announced the winners and I was really nervous. I had not eaten or slept and I was tired and cranky and freaking out. And um, they said, the 2000, 10 homecoming queen, Noelle Carney, and dad goes, shit, and I go, <laughs> and then he's like, you won, and I was like, oh. <laughs> but it scared, he scared me, I, I just kind of was like, oh, and he's like, shit, like, <laughs> but um, that was, that point in time was when he was sick, but we didn't know, and so, um, there's a lot of really amazing pictures of us from that night that I got to share with him. And you can tell that he wasn't completely healthy, but he was really happy. You could always tell, like no matter how sick he looked, his eyes were just piercing blue every time you walked in the room. His smile was just so big, no matter what. And um, sorry, I'm kind of going on a rant. I just wrote an outline, so. <laughs> okay, next subject, funny. Dad was really funny. Um, you know how most parents like make up nicknames for their kids, like really cute ones like Bean or Sweetie or something. He nicknamed me Spunky Duber. <laughs> so up until 19 years of age, my name has been Spunky Duber. That's not embarrassing. <laughs> no, and he used to have this story he'd tell us um, he, and we'd always, me and Nico, we always do it wherever we go. Um, we, he said he went to a restaurant with one buddy and the waiter came up and said like, what can I get you guys to drink? And his friend was like, oh, I'll have a Coke. And then my dad goes, two Cokes. Well, the waiter came back with a Coke and then gave dad two Cokes. <laughs> and so whenever we'd go anywhere to get drinks, we'd always be like, oh, two Cokes you know, to see what they do. And everywhere we go, Dad was always, would always be like, oh, two Cokes, you know, like. And then me and Nico and Dad had 
our special song, Cotton Eye Joe, which I think I taught some of you guys. Did, did, does anybody remember when I taught you guys that? <laughs> All right, well, I guess I'll have to share it because it's pretty funny. Um, we used to sing Cotton Eye Joe in the car, and I was pretty strict on them about singing it correctly. And Dad added a verse at the end that he wrote, and I'll just let you know what the words are. It goes, Cotton Eye Joe, gotta go to the bathroom. Cotton Eye Joe, gotta take a pee. Cotton Eye Joe, pss, don't do it on me, 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 not me. So that was Dad's verse. Um, and then even when he got really sick, he still was really funny. Um, I was really lucky that Dad was still around so that he could meet my boyfriend Chaz, who's really, it, it was really special to me. And um, they actually connected on the level of loving baseball. And um, it was funny because one, two months actually exactly before the day, or two months exactly before the day Dad passed away, we went and visited him. And uh, we walked in and we were like, hey, hi, hugs, kisses. And I said, so dad, I hear you've been walking a little bit. And he goes, oh, I run two marathons every day. <laughs> he's laying in his hospital bed. He's just, I run two marathons every day, no big deal. Like totally serious. But um, he still kept his humor and it, it was special to all of us because it's funny, Jasmine is hilarious. And Nico, me, and Jasmine, we can't be normal because we had dad. He made us so strange, but in a good way. Um, but I also wanted to tell you guys the story of when dad did pass away, for those of you that weren't here to experience that with us. Um, about five days, or five or six days before he passed away, the doctor said, you know, he only had like maybe a few hours or days. And so he was in the ICU and my brother and I had talked and we knew that like everybody kind of wanted him to make it, but when we'd been watching him struggle, like we really wanted him to know it was okay to go. And so we decided that it was time to tell him. And that's really hard. It was, it was really, I didn't know how to say it. And so we went and it was on Saturday and we went to the ICU and we sat with him and Nico couldn't talk. He was scared and I was too. We were both really scared. And I knew I had to say something because I think it felt uncomfortable because we were just crying. And I told him, I said, Daddy, you gotta go now. You gotta go because this isn't good. We don't like to see you in pain. We don't like to see you suffer. And so he sat there and he said, no, stop, be quiet. And we just, we kept telling him and Nico, I think he said it perfectly. He said, you've done what you need to do. You changed my life. You've been my biggest inspiration. You've taught me everything I need to know. And you've done it for hundreds of other people. And now you gotta do this for you. You've gotta, you gotta let yourself go. And so, of course, Dad didn't quite yet. He hung in there for six more days. But um, the day before he passed away, we decided to go see him again. And when we got there, there was about 35 students in his hospital room. And we had to kick him out. And so we kicked him out and we sat in the room and he wasn't responsive. Just, it was pretty clear that he was gonna go. And we felt like it was not right to just have it be us in the room. And so I went in the lobby where everybody was and I have to say, I'm really sorry if I scared you guys because I went in and I said, crying, excuse me, everyone. And I think everyone thought we were gonna, that he just passed away. And I go, we all want you in here with us. And I think everyone had a sigh of relief at that point because I just scared the crap out of them. But um, I said, bring instruments. We just want us all to be together. And so I walk it back into his hospital room. And it was 
the most beautiful, magical thing that happened next. I, I never think I'll love any moment more than this. One by one, everyone came in, and one man started singing this chant. And next thing you know, you've got a tambourine, a shaker, a conga, a clapping, and everyone is singing and playing music. It was like the biggest party in the world. It was so cool. And there was about 40 of us in the room. It was, it was really hot in the room. But it was beautiful. And they sang so many songs that dad has inspired them to know. And even though he couldn't respond, I know he loved it. I know he loved it. Because it was special for us too, all of us that were there. And um, then my dad's favorite song in the whole world is Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And Grace wanted me to sing it to him. And that's really hard to do. And so one of the guys got his guitar out and I started to sing it and I couldn't. And everybody started singing it to help me. And I couldn't. I can't, I can't even explain how beautiful it was, so I'm really grateful to have that experience with my dad. So thank you for everybody that was there. I think about it every day. And I know that dad, after that moment, I know he finally said, I can go now because I got everyone and I got what I, I wanted. And I know that meant a lot for him. Um, so then I wanna, well, I wanna, Welcome up here, two girls that are from my high school. We're gonna sing Summer Over the Rainbow, if I can. Um, we got together my junior year in high school and we started singing in my choir and we decided to do a girls trio and dad would always say like, oh, you guys are the best thing about the concert, you know? And um, we split up for about two years and on Thursday, June 14th, I texted them in the morning, and I said, can you guys come over? I need you to come sing to my dad. And um, we got to, they got to my house at like two, and we practiced all of our songs, and we got on the road and started heading to dad's, and by the time we got there, he passed away like about 10 minutes ago. but we still sing to him. And I know he heard it. Oh man, I don't wanna cry. But anyways, since then we've gotten back together and we started making a CD and learning more songs and it's crazy how something can spark you to wanna do what you love. And I think that's what dad gave a lot of people. So once I'm composed, we're gonna sing for you guys. We're gonna sing Summer of the Rainbow, which is my dad's favorite song. Thank you guys for being here. a hopeless jumble and the raindrops tumble all around heaven opens a magic lane when all the clouds darken up the skyway there's a rainbow highway to be found Just a step beyond the rain. Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, there's a land that I heard of once in a long
smells like lemon drops up way above the chimney tops. That's where you find me. or from 2006, there is a common thread that is sown through Michael's entire life. Michael and I became acquainted 45 years ago when I started dating his sister, Debbie, who is now my wife and who is in the audience. So on behalf of Michael's mother, uh, Jan, who is also here today, and sister Debbie, as well as his younger brother, Brian, and sister Trisha, who are still back in New York. I will try to be brief, but have a few stories to tell. <laughs> there are many who would like to take credit for the enormous talent Michael has. One of his oldest friends, Bill Decker, <clears throat> excuse me, Bill Decker, who still lives close to the old homestead, speaks often of the days in August 1966 when he convinced Mike to join the Shortsville Shamrocks Drum and Bugle Corps. Mike was 15 at the time. By the way, when I refer to him as Mike, um, his entire um, youth life, uh, we always referred to him as Mike. Um, I don't think he became Michael until he came to California. Uh, so I may go back and forth saying Mike or Michael. Um, the, well, anyway, the usual process for someone joining the drum corps as a rookie was to play cymbals or tenor drum for a year or so before a, a, a dancing to snare drum and eventually the drum line. At that time, Michael was the youngest member of the corps with very little playing experience, but he made it clear he wanted to play snare drum. He soon displayed the ability and desire to achieve his goal, and with every practice session, it became obvious that Michael had a unique talent. As the summer session of competition progressed, Michael became a solid performer with a very quiet confidence. On one particular occasion, as the Corps was rehearsing for a very important competition, there were some changes that needed to be made to the show and to the program by the instruction staff. 
Everything seemed to be going as planned when it became apparent, however, that the original drum music no longer fit the changes that they had made to the rest of the program. After several hours of the instructors trying to solve the problem, they told everybody to take a break and they would try to figure out a better solution. Well, during that break, Michael approached the drum instructor with an idea. Michael's idea was put into the program and within a short period of time, the section of music he wrote fit perfectly. Uh, so much for him being a rookie. Then there's Michael's own sister, Debbie, who tries to take some credit for his percussion skills because she claims he was always beating on her. Uh, but they were brothers and sisters like Nico and uh, Noel, and uh, I'm sure that, that that's what brothers and sisters do. There are some stories of walls and heads and uh, broken things. I won't go into any of that. Uh, but even more than that, and what she actually was referring to was his incessant need to be or tap on anything he could find all the time. We would be watching TV and he's tapping on the arm of the chair. We were at Thanksgiving dinner at his grandparents' house and he's at the dinner table beating out some tune with his fork and his knife. Uh, three or four years ago, uh, Michael and Grace visited us in New York and uh, we drove them to Niagara Falls. I was driving, he was in the back seat behind me, and for the two hours that it took us to get there, he was constantly tapping on the back of the seat. <laughs> I myself would like to take uh, some credit for Michael's talent because I introduced him to the world of professional music uh, when I asked him to be the drummer in my rock and roll band. Um, this was in 1968, and there's lots of stories from those days, as you might imagine, uh, but my favorite was his introduction to stardom in 1969, playing at a middle school assembly in Warren, Pennsylvania. <laughs> at that time, we were traveling, as Michael called it, we were on tour, <laughs> with, with a group of uh, traveling minstrels, or hippies at the time, um, who called themselves Larry Gross and The Happening Show. They traveled to schools um, in an old converted funeral hearse and talked about the dangers of drug use to middle school students. Uh, if you recall, this was the 60s, you know, Flower, Flower Power, LSD, The Beatles, Jimi Hendrix, all that stuff. Anyway, we were finishing our last song of the gig. Uh, Mike, who never wanted to be a front man back then, which is amazing, latter years, he was always out in front, but he never wanted to be a front man. Um, and he was sitting back behind his Zildjian cymbals with his cool sunglasses on in back of the rest of us. The kids are screaming when all of a sudden all these little teeny bopper girls stormed the stage, ran past us guitar players, got a hold of Mike and physically carried him off the stage. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating, I don't know how they did, of course he was a very small guy at the time but they physically carried him off the stage. We're not sure what happened back there, but um, he was on cloud nine for some time about that. <laughs> and, it was when, um, and it was when we had our first inkling that he was determined for great things. But no one can really claim any credit for the great talent he had except for himself. He was just born with it but more importantly, continued to pursue it and obviously improve on it. Uh, after his death, we ran his obituary in the local newspaper back home in New York, uh, which resulted of dozens of sentiments and comments from those who knew him in the old days and many who had not seen him um, since basically the, uh, the 60s and the 70s. Um, and if you'll bear with me, I'm just gonna read a few of them. Um, John wrote, my old classmate Mike Carney passed away yesterday. I remember in band in seventh grade when he picked up his sticks. He followed his dream of music all around the world and received many hours or many honors and earned much respect. Art wrote, I'm sorry to hear this. I knew Mike all through high school and he loved music. I remember telling him telling me that one day he would be a talented musician. I lost touch through the years, but I'm glad to find out his wishes came true. 
John wrote, sorry to hear this, thoughts and prayers to his family and friends. Mike was a great talent and inspired many young musicians. Back in the old days, there was always four or five drummers in Newark. Newark was our, uh, our hometown, Newark, New York, not New Jersey. Um, but as Tom wrote, back in the old days, there were, there were always four or five drummers in Newark, but then there was Mike Carney. Um, he was hands down better than anyone and we're and, uh, glad that he was able to fulfill his dreams. Uh, another person wrote, a classmate told me about Mike, my sympathy to his family and to his mother, who I met many years ago. I was at Eastman School of Music with Mike and he was an inspiration to me and others. He was a great talent and a determined musician. We shared some great times. I will never forget the stories he would tell, but always had trouble finishing them because we'd be laughing so hard. I have not seen Mike for, any, for many years, but will never forget him. Another person wrote, I had my first drum lessons from Mike. He was a great teacher. I had been in awe of him for a long time, and I remember finding it difficult to concentrate when I took lessons from him because he was so good. And finally, uh, Mike taught my father and the other Shrine members how to play the steel drums. What patience he had. He also performed at my father's memorial service and touched all of us there. Mike was a huge talent, a wonderful man. He will be missed, but I can imagine the joy of percussion heaven is experiencing right now. Excuse me, just one second. I lost my place. In summation, um, in this past February, um, my wife Debbie and I um, were in Florida and we were fortunate enough to, to be there um, in time for uh, Michael's father, Jack Kearney, um, who died after a long illness also. Um, so um, the only consolation that we have in, in Jack's death and in Mike's death is that at least when um, uh, Mike passed away, he had somebody to, to be a friend with and somebody to be with when, um, when, when he got to heaven. Um, thank you very much. Um, we appreciate um, everything that everyone has done for Mike and his family. Um, obviously, being 3,000 miles away, there's not an awful lot that we could do. We tried to keep in touch and do as much as we could. Um, but we thank every, everybody for everything that they did. And, Thank you for being here.